ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your MCs for the evening. Vicki Russell, Sarah Dubert, and Meg Judy. I'm just here to hold the goods. <laughs> I'm your arm candy. I'm your Vanna White. Ah, uh, Vanna. This is it. Yeah, Vanna. This is Meg Judy. Am I Pat? <laughs> this. I mean, you could be Pat. <laughs> <laughs> this is Sarah do Dubert. Want, do you want me to be Pat? You want to hold this? And I'll just wait. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I wish we could just do a big group hug. Everyone deserves one to come out on this chilly, muggy night. And thank you all for being here. Um, so we have a great night in store. And as Chris hinted earlier, we are going to keep things up and keep it lively. So tonight, as you know, we are here to honor and celebrate three new and deserving enshrinees into the Boone County Hall of Fame in recognition for their remarkable contributions to the community and beyond. We will also use this opportunity to raise some money, surprise, for the Boone County Historical Society's Endowment Trust. The Boone County Historical Society today, I will tell you from firsthand experience, is light years ahead of what it was when I was first there and involved in many decades ago. Um, I've been told by people familiar with historical societies around the state that ours is clearly top tier and among the very best in so many ways. Um, including robust program, programming and historic assets. We should all be proud of that and recognize that offering such rich and diverse programs to people of all ages costs money. And as we all know, prices are not going down. So we ask you to participate in our various funding opportunities with Gusto. We respect your time and with your help, we will conclude at a reasonable hour. <laughs> if you haven't already, please dig into those salads and enjoy the rest of your dinners. Keep eating, even though we're going to jump off the high dive right now. So Sarah, tell us what else is happening. OK, so I am your money girl for the night. So as we move through the night, those of you who have a program, find your programs that you picked up when you came in. The information for the online link for the online silent auction is in your program. So check it out. You'll use the number that's on your program is your bidder number. And so use that link to bid not one time, not two times, maybe 10 times or so on. Uh, you can just bid right on your smartphone. I won't even get mad. Meg and I won't tell you to put those phones no, up. No, no. And I think they should, like, outbid themselves. Oh, yeah. Right. It'd be, you know, your, your own best competition, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Also, thank you to the many local businesses and individuals, many of you are in this room, who have made donations for the silent auction items. We greatly appreciate that. If you want to go check out some of the items, they're located over here um, on that little raised platform, but be sure to bid often and bid high. Um, we will be closing this auction whenever I feel like it. So... <laughs> Basically, we're going to look for some numbers up there, so maybe it's 7.30, maybe it's closer to 8, but make sure that you don't delay, because I might just pull it out from under you. Um, and I want to tell you about two she's fantastic like that. raffles. I am like that. Yeah, she said yesterday, she's like, hey, I think I'm the reason that we said that we could get $1,500 more for X, Y, or Z. I'm like, yeah, I think that was you. Yeah. It was, it was. <laughs> um, another thing is we've got two fantastic raffles tonight, and they're new. We have not done this before. So, there is a restaurant gift card raffle. It features gift cards from more than 30 dining establishments, from $25 to $50 plus. It has a combined value of over $1,000, and we're going to raffle it off. There are raffle tickets that we have some um, folks from, where are some of you, who will be walking around selling raffle tickets. Those are either one for $20 or six for $100. They'll be stopping by your tables. Raise your hand. There you go. We got them over here. They'll just take your bidder number. You don't even have to have cash, so that's great. 
We will do that drawing later on. And then secondly, and this is why we have Meg on standby over here for security. And I think Batter we have some up, security. Right? <laughs> we need somebody to hold the necklace. <laughs> Rough job. And Kevin Crane's my security. I don't know where he went, but he's got a badge. Yeah, he's got a badge and everything. So. Hopefully he's not packing. I'm going to make him wear it. Love it. So thanks to Book Raiders, we have this beautiful donated necklace valued at $3,000. We'll be walking around, take a look at it. Um, those raffle tickets are $50 each, and we will draw for the winner of the diamond necklace later. Think of this as an opportunity to do some early Christmas shopping. Okay, now please welcome the 2023 Endowment Trust Board Chair, our friend Susan Hart. Good evening and welcome to the 2023 Boone County Historical Society's History Makers Hall of Fame Gala. I'm Susan Hart, and I'm honored to be the 2023 Chair of the Boone County Historical Society's Endowment Trust. I want to take this opportunity to thank the generosity of many individuals and organizations whose support makes our evening possible. Our gold sponsors this evening are Commerce Bank and City of Columbia. Silver sponsors are Betsy and, Bet Betsy and Bruce Odell and the Boone Electric Cooperative. Thank you to Book Raiders Jewelry and my fellow endowment trustee, Joan Menser, for the donation of that stunning diamond necklace, which is our featured raffled item this evening. Throughout the evening, our many event sponsors, table sponsors, and advocate donors will be listed on the video screens, and they are listed in the program that you have tonight. It also takes the work of many individuals, and I want to thank the following operational support people who make tonight's event possible. Monica Garant is our amazing event coordinator, Jonathan Sessions and his team at Virtuo for providing us our technical needs this evening. Our stage manager this evening is Ella Larson, who makes sure things will run smoothly. And Chris Howe and his company, Sound Concepts, are providing the audio-visual elements of this gala. I also want to thank the Hall of Fame Planning Committee, who has spent the last eight months in preparation for tonight's celebration. I'd like them to please be stand and recognized at this time. Again, our purpose here tonight is to honor our newest enshrinees into the Boone County Hall of Fame. Two exceptional individuals in one exceptional institution. Charles Morgan Thaler, the food bank for Central and Northeast Missouri, and retired Air Force Colonel John Clark. We're also here to support the Boone County Historical Society's Endowment Trust, which exists to preserve the rich history and culture of our community. On behalf of the endowment trustees, I want to thank you so much for all of your support of this important celebration. At this time, I'd like to welcome to the podium Boone County Historical Society's Executive Director, Chris Campbell. Thank you, Susan, and welcome, everybody. Um, for nine years now, it's been my privilege and honor to be the executive director of the nonprofit Boone County Historical Society and our home, the Boone County History and Culture Center. And uh, this is, for me, this is the highlight of the year. And so many of us on our team work so hard to get to this evening um, each year. Um, I'm really excited we're here, and I'm really excited about tomorrow morning, too, when I can just rest. That's what I meant. Um, I want to thank the, our whole staff. Uh, Mary Ellen Lohman, who's Director of Admin and Communications, uh, Madeline Bloss, Brian Flanagan, uh, Montmany Art Gallery Director Betsy Kanabi Rowe, Matt Federley, our Stage Manager Ella Larson, and our Finance Team Member Laura Pieper of Bloom Bookkeeping. Laura's over there. Thank you, Laura. Um, and I also want to point out uh, someone who's almost always behind the scenes. His name is Carl Busson. Uh, Carl owns and runs Bussin Productions. 
Carl for three years now. And Carl, I would like for you to stand and wave so everybody can see you. And the handsome guy in the fedora back there. Bussin Productions is a, a magical storytelling company. And Carl is a terrific storyteller with a video camera in his hand. And for three years now, he's been co-producing the, the videos you're going to see this evening with me. And I couldn't be happier uh, with the incredible work that he puts out. So I wanted to make sure he was recognized. He's already hugely popular in this town with a number of major companies. Some of you uh, are uh, clients of his, and I hope he gets uh, several more of you if he has time. But again, that's Carl Bussin with Bussin Productions. Thank you for coming out. I um, want to talk briefly about the three enshrinees. Every year, the three that we enshrine are incredibly special, and this year is no different. Um, there's a couple things they have in common. The first thing that is apparent, glaringly apparent, is the pursuit of excellence. This is true of an artist from Hallsville who passed 43 years ago, Charles Morgenthaler. This is true of Colonel Clark. This is certainly true of the food bank. Um, taking it a step further, I, I looked into what makes a phenomenal artist and what makes an elite jet pilot. And maybe I wasn't that surprised, but maybe a little, that there's a lot of commonality, because when I did the research, this is what I found. Artists and jet pilots both have these things in common. Single-mindedness, persistence, fearlessness. And we can imagine that with someone that finds it, flies a plane at 600 miles an hour. But it's true, I know, from all the artists I know, that to be an artist and a good one, you have to be fearless as well. And Morgan Thaler was discipline and patience. I think you'll see these threads run through the three videos that Carl and I have produced for you tonight. We hope you enjoy them. Um, I'm extremely excited uh, about uh, the recognition those three people are going to receive tonight. Because, and I've said this before, I might sound like a broken record for those of you that come regularly. This is your Hall of Fame, and it's the only civic Hall of Fame in Central Missouri. There's lots of Hall of Fames regarding business and trades and certainly athletics. This is about the community's Hall of Fame. You can be an educator, a teacher, and get into this Hall of Fame. You can be a CEO and get into this Hall of Fame. You can run a terrific nonprofit uh, for the underprivileged and get in this Hall of Fame. It's everybody's Hall of Fame, and it's the only one like it. And I hope all of you are as proud of the Hall of Fame itself as you are of your friends that often are inducted into it. Uh, and on that note, thank you. And on that note, and I'll conclude with this, I want to recognize, for the benefit of all of you, and because they deserve it, uh, our Hall of Famers that are in the audience tonight, those that have been inducted and enshrined into this Hall of Fame in years past. And so stand if you're willing. If you're not, just maybe a, a tip of the hat or a wave. But please uh, say hello to Columbia College, last year's business recipient uh, down there. Then Columbia College, give us a wave. There we are. I want to tell you that Boone Electric Cooperative is a silver sponsor tonight, but they weren't able to attend. I think there's some illness running through the executive ranks there, but I want to thank Boone Electric Cooperative, who was our business recipient a few years ago. I want to acknowledge uh, the legendary Norm Stewart, there he is. Norm's a Boone County Hall of Famer. Several years ago, uh, it was the, my first occasion to meet Norm, was to go into his home and sit down and start videotaping uh, for one of these, these videos. And uh, of course, I knew who he was, and I knew he didn't know who the hell I was. So to break the ice, I came in and I sat down next to him, and I said, I just want you to know, Coach, I understand that we are only the 17th most important Hall of Fame you've ever been put in. <laughs> and it worked, I got him to laugh. Cindy Mustard is with us tonight, Hall of Famer Cindy is back there in the back. I want to recognize Book Raiders Jewelry because Joan Minzer uh, sponsored this table that Norm Stewart's at and others are at, and Book Raiders is responsible because of Joan's uh, leadership and donating that phenomenal $3,000 necklace you saw a few minutes ago. Donated it. 
uh, so that we could support the endowment trust. So thank you, book readers and Joan. Um, is Ray Beck here this evening? Where is he? Ray, there's a Hall of Famer. Former city manager, Ray Beck. And I've got one more to introduce that I know is in the room, but please, if there's anyone here that's also a Hall of Famer that I missed, please just shout out, because we want to recognize you too. But the last one I know in the room is Stevens College is represented by President Diane Lynch. And there you are, right there. And thank you for hosting us here tonight. It's a fantastic venue. Did I miss any Hall of Famers? Okay. Well, listen, uh, please welcome back to the stage your MCs for the evening, Sarah, Vicki, and Meg. Have a great time. Bid early and bid often. Thank you. We are now going to honor our first Boone Kenny Hall of Fame and trainee of the evening. Um, and before we do that, let's give a shout out to the family representatives at the Mar Morgan Thayer Thaler table right here. And to the representatives from the Hallsville Historical Society, who I think are at a table over here. Yeah, welcome, all of you. We are pleased to introduce you, by way of this video, to our newest Boone County Hall of Fame and trainee, the late Charles Morgan Thaler. Well, there's a lot of things about this that's, that's to me, powerful. Uh, one is the town, uh, the picture of the town and what it was like at that point in time. And the other thing is the, the people. Uh, you can see the, the kind of dress that they had. Uh, I see one fellow here has a bicycle. There's horses and carriages in this picture. Um, so it, it, it gives you a real powerful perspective of how the people lived and, and existed at that point in time. In June 1893, in the small farming town of Hallsville, Missouri, the local blacksmith, a deaf man named William Morgenthaler, was informed his wife Ruth had just given birth to a boy. And while the sleepy town celebrated the arrival of its newest son, no one could have guessed the baby boy would someday become its most famous citizen, an acclaimed artist known throughout the nation and in Europe. But that is just what happened for Charles Albert Morgenthaler. Reflecting on his childhood, Charles used to say that he liked being where the action was. It may be hard to believe that Hallsville saw much action in the 1890s and the early 1900s. Yet Charles was there at the scene of a rail train crash drawing the tragic accident in pencil. He was also known to use early handheld cameras to photograph the local parades, a traveling circus, and local fires. At a young age, he was documenting every fascinating thing he saw, either with a photograph or with a pencil or a brush. After graduating from Columbia High School in 1913, he went straight to Kansas City to find work as a freelance artist. He returned in 1916 to take one year of art courses at the University of Missouri. And in 1917, Charles traveled to Chicago to study at the famed Art Institute. Before completing his first year, however, he chose to enlist in the Army to serve in World War I. And although Charles was assigned an aerial photographer's job, and was about to be shipped off to Europe, the war suddenly ended, and he was able to return to his studies in Chicago and his childhood sweetheart, his wife, Teeny. In the early 1920s, he took a job as a surveyor and map maker with the Missouri Highway Department. He also began to design theatrical sets and theater interiors. After graduating from the Art Institute, the couple moved to St. Louis, which would become their home for many years. Charles produced paintings that would end up in the Masonic Temple in Kansas City, the Fox and Ambassador Theaters in St. Louis, and the Arrowhead Lodge in Osage, Missouri. 
He also drew more than 20 college yearbook covers, including the 1921 University of Missouri's Savitar. All through the Depression and World War II, Charles worked for several advertising firms while taking on freelance work, illustrating books, pamphlets, and newspaper ads. He also created murals for several churches and businesses throughout the state. He was the consummate artistic and commercial professional in oils, watercolors, pencil, and charcoal. In 1946, Charles was one of only six American artists the USO asked to go to post-war Germany as a volunteer and sketch injured servicemen. He continued that work during and after the Korean conflict. By 1959, he had sketched over 1,400 servicemen and women. The USO would send the artwork to the parents of the service members, and on a few occasions, the sketch and letter from the USO would be the family's first news their son or daughter was still alive. In 1951, Charles was honored with the commission to restore the mural in the Missouri State Capitol's dome, and in 1959, he was asked to supervise the work of restoring the legendary Gettysburg Cyclorama at the Gettysburg National Park. That work took three years to accomplish, and while he and Teeny lived in Gettysburg, he also painted backgrounds for several presidential figures in the Hall of Presidents. After a few happy years spent in Washington, Missouri, the couple moved to Columbia in 1966 for their retirement. Charles was referred to by art colleagues as a humble man, a pillar of the St. Louis art community and a marvelous talent. The lifelong member of the Masonic Lodge and a charter member of the Post 202 of the Columbia American Legion continued to paint and draw and enjoyed several exhibits of his work at the Columbia Art League. During this period and after Charles' death in 1980, many of his works went to the State Historical Society of Missouri, the University of Missouri's Museum of Art and Archaeology, and 120 of his drawings and sketches were donated to the Boone County Historical Society. Interestingly, there has been a decades-long debate about whether the family name is pronounced Morgenthaler or Morgenthaler. The German surname was thought to be pronounced as Morgenthaler up until the outbreak of World War II. However, it's said that the family patriarch William, the blacksmith, requested the family go by Morgenthaler to avoid the discrimination and hate that went with possessing a German name at that time. But when the war concluded, some in the family returned to the original pronunciation, while others clung to Morgan Thaler. To this day, there are prominent family members who refer to themselves as Morgan Thaler, while most of the population of Hallsville know the family as Morgan Thalers. It's a testament to the legacy Charles left that he is only the third visual artist to be enshrined in the Boone County Hall of Fame, joining Sabra Tolmeyer and George Caleb Bingham. Ladies, gentlemen, and esteemed friends, please welcome into the Boone County Hall of Fame, Charles A. Morgan Thaler. Gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Charles Morgan Thaler Thaler, three nieces, Dana Morgan Thaler or Thaler, you'll have to tell us, Jean Taylor and Pat McGill, and I think Pat is the spokesperson.
this isn't going to fit. <laughs> All righty. Okay. On behalf of the Morgan Thaler, Mountjoy, McBride, and McGill families, I would like to thank the Boone County Historical Society for bestowing this special honor on Charles Morgan Thaler. My name is Pat McGill, and I am the oldest living descendant of Charles Morgan Thaler. My mother and Charles were brother and sister. My two cousins, Jean and Dana, my nieces and nephews over at the table, and I have reflected on our times uh, with Uncle Charles and Aunt Teenie and wish to share a few of our memories from over 40 years ago. We know Uncle Charles is a kind and gentle soul who always greeted us with a smile and kind words. He fostered in us an appreciation of art. A trip to the St. Louis Art Museum was a must when we visited them in St. Louis. He encouraged us to draw and paint and express ourselves through art. He never seemed to mind having us underfoot at his home or in his studio. Uh, where he showed us his recent drawings or his older framed art. My nephew Mike, who's seated over here, was six years old when Uncle Charles wrote in his journal that Mike loved to draw and wanted to be an artist someday. Uncle Charles always talked with Mike and encouraged him to paint and draw. Today, Mike is an amazing artist. Uncle Charles would be so thrilled. Uncle Charles Cherry's family, he and Aunt Teeny were frequent attendees at our family gatherings, especially Thanksgiving and Christmas. Even when we were little kids, he made an effort to get to know each of us and find out our interest and our activities. He recorded this information in his Bible, which was the place he journaled. He and Aunt Teeny were so devoted to each other. He adored her, and she kept him motivated and focused. They were a great team. We remember him as a man who loved history. He kept detailed records about family history, and many of his paintings had historical significance. Jean, Dana, and I, and our mothers visited Uncle Charles when he was restoring the cyclorama at the Gettysburg National Battlefield. Our uncle was the perfect tour guide as we visited all of the Civil War sites. He loved rivers and trains, and they were depicted in many of his paintings. My nephew, David, who's over here, mentioned the oil painting, the J.M. White, Mistress of the Mississippi, as one of his favorites. In their later years, Uncle Charles and Aunt Teeny lived in a large historic home with one of those widow's walks next to the train tracks and overlooking the Missouri River in Washington, Missouri. He loved that home and that setting. One other little memory that we had was his love of blue. He always wore blue clothing with a crisp, freshly ironed blue dress shirt. Blue was also a predominant color in many of his paintings. In closing, our family is so proud of this honor. We know that our Uncle Charles would have been so touched 
by this recognition. And we also do appreciate the efforts of all people who work on this event and this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you and congratulations to the Morgan Thaler branch of the family. This next part of the evening gets even more and more special. Right now, we have a special surprise announcement. Please welcome Endowment Board Trustee Marie Hunter and Board Director David Wilson, who's going to tell us all about it. And so um, we weren't wisely maybe part of designing this logo, um, but we did get to see it just slightly before you all. And I have to say, they did all right with the fonts. It's a good logo. Um, so here, uh, the first glimpse at the logo for the 100th anniversary of the Boone County Historical Society. There it is. It's got the cute little Boone County and the zero. Great. Um, so, uh, uh, as if I didn't already, I'm going to go off script just for a moment again and ask for you all to reflect a little on how lucky we are to live in Boone County. Um, one needs only to consider the daily headlines. Um, and in this moment, um, where those headlines are bleak to say the least, um, there's not a lot we can do. We can feel lucky for being here tonight. And then the other important thing here we can do is remember our histories, right? There's a hundred years of history in this organization, well more than a hundred years of history in Boone County, um, thousands of years of collective history in this room. And so by being here tonight, by supporting this organization, and by supporting this hundred year project, um, we remember those histories, those varied histories, those, those multiple histories. Um, we have some big ideas for next year. There will be a hundred year exhibit um, we will be pulling some of the most interesting, curious, coolest items from the collection of the Historical Society, one for each year of the last 100 years. Um, that exhibit will be coming out. We've got other things planned. I'm working on a treasure hunt. Don't tell anyone. Um, and those will exhibit, that exhibit will be going on display from April to December next year. Naturally, these things do not come without a cost. They are, in fact, very expensive to pull off, and that's where we all come in. Um, this fund and need, this next fund and need is special, um, but you don't need Marie and I for that. Sarah, Meg, take it from here. We're back. We are back. Okay, look for us to do some really fun things next year, including that big exhibit titled 100 Years, 100 Objects. 
We'll be pulling out the 100 coolest things in the collection vaults. And they're going to, you know, things that have not been seen in years, putting them on display from April to December of next year. So mark your calendars. You don't need to go on a vacation. You just go to the Boone County Historical Society. That will not happen without a cost. And we are here to help with this next Fund the Need. Again, next year marks 100 years of the Boone County Historical Society preserving our local history, 1924 to 2024. To celebrate, we'll have some special exhibits with, again, the 100 artifacts, calling it 100 years, 100 objects. The grand display will require additional lighting, display cases, pedestals, and more, which means money. Here we go, right? All right. It is now time to honor our second enshrinee of the evening, a beloved and essential institution in our community. We want to welcome two tables of representatives from the Food Bank for Central and Northeast Missouri who are here and here. So welcome to all of you. And we are going to learn a lot more about this institution by watching the video. This organization the, is so important for the community. The work that's done here is so, it's necessary, it's so good. And, you know, just to see how the food bank was able to rise to the occasion in the pandemic. You know, people who never had food insecurity in the past are now seeing it. So, you know, I think that one of the things that is so impressive to me is that you don't have to sell anybody on why the food bank is important in this community. For instance, this past weekend, I had my family, we were um, out at the mall soliciting donations for Pack the Pantries. And, you know, I had my seven-year-old and my eight-year-old walking up to people saying, would you like to make a donation to the food bank? And you don't even get bank out of your mouth before you see people reaching for their wallets. I think that, you know, Everybody understands it's necessary, and you're grateful to not need the services, and you're also grateful to know that if you should need the services, they're there. So it's, I think that's the thing about the food bank is just like universally, you don't have to convince anybody why it's necessary in this community. In Missouri, over 700,000 of our 6.2 million residents face hunger. Almost 200,000 of them are children. It can begin with a job layoff or a medical emergency and result in a parent not being able to obtain the food needed to feed the family. Studies show that food insecure parents experience anxiety, shame, and embarrassment. And their children sometimes experience delayed development, chronic illnesses, behavioral issues. Fortunately, there's a local nonprofit that exists to address this critically important need. But that wasn't the case in 1981. And so a group of organizations came together to form the Central Missouri Food Bank Network. It would grow in size and scope over the next 42 years into the organization it is today, the Food Bank for Central and Northeast Missouri. The Food Bank distributed 68,000 pounds of food in its first full year of operation. Today, with a staff of around 70, they provide the equivalent of 24 million meals annually to a network of partner agencies across 32 counties. In 1986, the Food Bank partnered with Second Harvest, the National Food Bank Network, known now as Feeding America. The impact of the partnership was immediate. The food bank's annual distribution of food more than doubled to over one million pounds. When the Great Flood of 1993 impacted nearly all of the food bank's service area, the organization acted quickly to respond to the crisis. By the end of that year, it had provided 4.6 million pounds of food and supplies to Missouri citizens, the largest volume shared in the organization's history. That year, the food bank waived the shared maintenance fees. It previously charged its partner agencies. The food bank never reinstituted the fees, and to this day, 
It is the only food bank in Missouri, and one of the few in the nation, to provide food to partner agencies at no cost. The mid-90s ushered in an era of new opportunities for the food bank, as new partners joined in the effort to fight hunger. In 1994, Mizzou's head football coach, Larry Smith, designated the spring black and gold game as a fundraiser for the food bank, asking attendees to donate either $3 or two cans of food to be admitted. It marked the beginning of a long-standing relationship between Mizzou Athletics and the food bank. Today, head coach Eli Drinkwitz leads Score Against Hunger, and the food bank has become the official charitable partner of Mizzou Athletics. The 2000s saw the food bank introduce several programs that still operate today, including senior boxes and school markets. The Buddy Pack program started in 2005 as a pilot program with only 80 students. Today, more than 7,000 children across the food bank service area receive Buddy Packs. In 2010, the organization officially changed its name to the Food Bank for Central and Northeast Missouri and soon adopted a foods to encourage philosophy. It focuses on nutritional foods instead of less expensive, shelf stable foods. Today, 64% of the food shared annually includes proteins, dairy, whole grains, and fresh and frozen produce. In 2023, the food bank will feed as many as 100,000 Missourians a month across 32 counties through more than 145 partner agencies, nearly 200 schools, and several signature programs. So we have just experienced tremendous growth at the food bank over the, almost the last decade, honestly, um, nine years almost that I've been in this role. And when you think about who or, or what is responsible for that, I credit that to two different entities. Uh, the first, we are so fortunate to have such a strong board of directors, the leadership that they provide, the expertise, the geographic representation, the skill set. Um, they just are a phenomenal group of people. And then it all comes back to the team at the food bank. It truly does. For years, the food bank has dreamed of finding a new and larger home for its central pantry. Now a new location on Business Loop 70 West in Columbia is a dream realized. It will allow the operation to expand even further with 8,000 square feet of cold storage, 11,000 square feet of warehouse space, and a demonstration kitchen for nutritional education. It will also provide space to partner agencies offering housing, utilities, and health care resources in the same building. The facility is currently nearing completion. It will be called the Food Bank Market. The larger and better equipped facility will significantly improve access to food and other services while providing an experience that destigmatizes the use of a pantry for food access. 42 years after its founding, the Food Bank is one of the largest organizations in the state dedicated to sharing food and bringing hope. Powered by the community, the Food Bank is thankful for all the donors, volunteers, and advocates that have supported it over the years, including its board of directors. Ladies, gentlemen, and esteemed friends, please welcome into the Boone County Hall of Fame, the first nonprofit ever enshrined, the Food Bank for Central and Northeast Missouri. President of the Food Bank, Lindsay Lopez. Thank you so much, Vicki. Well, I'm going to ask, and Stephen actually works at the Food Bank and is a photographer, too. Um, so I'm going to ask if we can hold off on this photo so we can get the team in later, because this is not just about me. Um, wow, what an amazing video and so incredible 
to see us inducted into the Boone County Historical Society Hall of Fame this evening. It, this recognition is so meaningful, especially as we are the very first nonprofit to receive this honor. The food bank has been part of the Boone County community for more than 40 years, as you heard, but how we serve the community has changed significantly over that time. Often people are familiar with the food bank, but not as familiar with the prevalence of food insecurity in Boone County, Missouri, and our nation. The food bank serves, as you heard, as many as 100,000 people across 32 counties each month, including more than 7,000 students who receive food each week of the school year. In Boone County alone, the food bank works with 31 partner agencies and dozens of school partners to share millions of pounds of food. In fact, last year, we provided more than 30 million pounds of food to, uh, with a wholesale value of more than $50 million. The food bank's partners in Boone County are groups you know and may support. They include Aging Best, First Chance for Children, Into Action, Rainbow House, Tiger Pantry, True North, Welcome Home, Salvation Army, and more. The Food Bank's Central Pantry, soon to be the Food Bank Market, serves as many as 10,000 Boone County residents each month. 10,000 Boone County residents each month. These are our neighbors, our friends, our family, and our colleagues. And often the struggle of food insecurity is quiet, but it is prevalent. The economic moment is challenging, and we're seeing trends toward more need as well as higher prices. Just recently, actually just several days ago, the USDA released a report on household food security. Their research found that in 2022, one in seven people, including one in five children, in the US live in food insecure households. This is an increase of more than 30% and 40% respectively from the previous year the highest rate and number since 2014, and the largest one-year increase since 2008. All the while, costs are increasing. The food bank is spending three times more on food and transportation than pre-pandemic. This is our new normal. So we are adapting to the needs of the moment, but we cannot stop planning for the future. And I am excited to tell you more about that future. On Wednesday, this next Wednesday, our new facility, the Food Bank Market, will open to share food at no cost with those in need. Operations at Central Pantry will move to the business loop, and we will continue to operate our main location on Vandiver Drive. The market provides a large and well-equipped space where the Food Bank team can share food with the community, as well as host services that offer whole person support to help lift neighbors into food security. The Food Bank's work is built on partnership and with 31 formal partner agencies in this community and many, many other collaborators, we aim to be a convener of resources. Often, neighbors in need of food also need access to other resources, but time is also a limited resource. With space for visiting services, neighbors will be able to access food as well as resources like SNAP enrollment help, information on Medicaid, legal advice, utilities assistance, and more, all in one single location. In addition, Compass Health Network, the building's medical tenant, will offer preventive and primary health care services on an ongoing basis. We are absolutely thrilled to have them on board. And with a demonstration kitchen, the food bank's registered dietitian will have the setup to share samples of healthy meals made with pantry staples and provide educational opportunities so neighbors can learn to store and prepare some of our most nutritious offerings like fresh produce. The model the market is piloting is truly innovative and the food bank team will pilot programs and establish best practices that will scale across our service area to move the needle for all of Missouri and beyond. In short, the food bank market is the culmination of more than 40 years of dedicated food security work, but it is just the beginning of the new and innovative work we have planned to help nourish our neighbors in Boone County and beyond. We can't wait to share this important space with the community. So I'm gonna shift and I'm going to give a thank you, um, and I'm going to say, the food bank cannot do this work without all of you. So I'm going to ask if you would raise your hand, if you have volunteered for the food bank, if you have donated to the food bank funds, food, or helped us in some way.
Would you raise your hand? That is remarkable. And I would like to ask for a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. We cannot do this work without you. Um, in the video, you heard recognition of our phenomenal team, our amazing board of directors. I want to thank them, too. Would you all please give a wave? And let's have a round of applause for them. So in sum, I would just say thank you on behalf of the neighbors we serve. We cannot do this work without you, and we are very, very appreciative for this honor tonight. Congratulations to the food bank. We will take the picture after, it looks like. It's a wild bunch. They're like, where's the party? Who wants to take our picture? While they're getting their picture taken, I would say if you have any interest in buying a raffle ticket for either the $1,000 worth of restaurant gift cards or, or the fancy, the necklace, fancy necklace. The fancy, fancy necklace. Right. I, where did Kevin take it is my question. Kevin Crane had it last I saw. He might have left with it. He maybe he left with it. Interested, please raise your hand. Our lovely volunteers are going to come and collect those. Oh, I got one right here at this table. Oh, Tim. There Tim go. wants Tim to buy his one. lovely oh. wife a necklace. Oh, look Vicente's at you. in. He said they've been married for 73 years. 53. That, that feels like a big difference there, Meg. Does it feel like 73? Okay, so we only have three things left. We are going to do our final fund to need, and we will go down to $100. So those of you who missed out because the silent auction is closed and you didn't get to spend that money you wanted to donate tonight, well, you the will money have is, a chance. It's burning a hole, it's right, Sarah? It's burning a hole. Do not leave. Don't take it home. Absolutely. So we will have our last fund of night. We will pull the raffle for the restaurant. We will pull the raffle for that beautiful diamond necklace, and we will have our final induction into the Hall of Fame. We're first going to have a little auction. Okay. Our ne um, congratulations, Food Bank, one more time. So now I'm going to tell you about a fund and need auction item that is um, my personal favorite. It's that it's to fund the Henry J. Waters III Digital Imaging Lab. In 2016, when Hank, my late husband, was to be enshrined into this Hall of Fame. Karen Miller wanted to do something extra to honor him. We put our heads together and decided it was time to start properly digitizing and archiving the unparalleled collection of photo negatives that had been languishing in the vaults of the society for decades. On the night of Hank's induction, we surprised him by launching the fundraising effort for the Digital Imaging Lab, a concept he fully embraced and supported. The society was then able to start buying equipment and materials and has digitized more than 29,000 glass plate negatives since then. The initiative has been led mostly by volunteers who have been thoroughly trained to properly handle and clean the negatives and to embed the data and images in such a way that they can be found forever and that information, as it goes online, is free to the public. And by the way, these negatives came from a series of Boone County photographers who kept keeping the negatives and giving them to the next photographer who bought the studios. It is a remarkable correction, collection. So, as you've heard tonight, we still have more than 480,000 unscanned negatives waiting for attention and the necessary supplies get more expensive. I know, it sounds like a crazy number, but we've done 30,000 since we started. The Smith, I think um, Chris mentioned the Smithsonian Institute thinks this is the biggest collection of lo local photographs in the country. Another something for us to be proud of, and I will say, I'm sure Hank is kind of watching what's going on here, and would, I don't know, let the air out of my tires, if I didn't open the bidding at $1,000. Oh, I was there gonna we go. Say, he, he's going to talk to you later if you don't, yeah, right? Yeah, I, I would be in trouble. <laughs> okay. 
Next up, where are those raffle tickets? Ooh, we need Meg to pull the winning. And you know what, Vicki? You're going to keep her honest because... Me? Yeah. She's got to keep me honest? Heck yeah. I wore big she shoes to try to handle this lady. Okay, so first up, headed on up there. First up, we're going to do the raffle ticket for the $1,000 in gift cards. Oh, I do a drum roll, people. I can't do it. Like stomp your feet, something. <laughs> All right, here we go. Ticket number 888978. 8? 888978. Oh, 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 Shane! Shane Alexander. No, Where are we going to at, dinner? Look at that face. She's my I neighbor. I don't have to drive home. Okay, Not a bad $20 investment. Okay. okay. Now, we are ready for the diamond pendant. Okay. You ready? The diamond pendant. Everybody hold your breath. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's not the same No, nope, It's right there. Right there. Wait. Different, different bucket. Okay, And the diamond go. pendant is going home with? And I did not put a raffle in, so I can't give myself a necklace. Number 139, Ben Carter. Oh. Where's Ben? There's Ben! Yeah. Yay. Yay! Congratulations! A beautiful $3,000 necklace. Not he gave a bad me like a, He gave me like a Queen Elizabeth wave. Like he didn't know what to do with that win. I love it. I'm going to give this back to you because they might need it up front. I know you are all as pleased and honored as I am to be here to help induct this very special entrainee into the Boone County Hall of Fame. Let us learn more by watching the video about Colonel John Clark. You know, I've thought many times, Chris, as, as you've just asked, is uh, what is the takeaway? And the takeaway is that we all need heroes. We all need examples. We all need to see how it is done the very best by the very best and for the very best reasons. To be a citizen, and to be a Columbia resident, and to be an American is the highest honor anybody could have. And to recognize constantly, daily, how we have to rededicate ourselves to the effort and the tasks that are necessary to maintain and retain our country, our freedom, and our citizenship. And to see somebody that sacrificed so much for so long, who is still alive and still promoting it unabashedly and enthusiastically, and to show the positive results of those efforts is inspiring to me and it rededicates me to go out tomorrow and do the very best I can for our country and for God. From as far back as John Clark can remember, he wanted to fly airplanes. The Columbia native and 1957 Hickman High School graduate never really thought about anything else for a career. And so the young engineering student entered the University of Missouri's Air Force ROTC program and eventually became its Cadet Corps Commander, leading over 2,000 fellow cadets. After graduation, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Air Force and soon entered pilot training at Reese Air Force Base in Texas in 1962. After his first tour of duty flying medical evacuation aircraft out of McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey, Clark traveled to Alconbury Air Base in England, where he joined the 1st Tactical Reconnaissance Squadron. This assignment determined what Clark would be doing in the Vietnam conflict. Not dogfighting in a jet fighter, but reconnaissance. In 1964, the United States Air Force introduced a reconnaissance version of their already high-performing F-4 fighter jet. The magnificent state-of-the-art jet in different configurations could now perform two equally important tasks, fight in the sky and spy on the enemy. We're at Missouri's Whiteman Air Force Base, and I'm standing next to the fighter version of the McDonald Aircraft F-4 Phantom II. The reconnaissance version of this jet, the RF-4C, is what Captain John Clark piloted. 
The new warplane was a beast that could fly 1,300 miles per hour at any altitude between 100 feet and 57,000 feet. It was a two-seat, twin-engine, all-weather, long-range, supersonic feat of engineering. The RF-4C took photos at both high and low altitude, day or night. It carried no offensive armament, and it didn't fly a company. As the Air Force recon community of pilots like to say, they flew alone, unarmed, and unafraid. Clark had already flown 60 reconnaissance missions over Vietnam prior to the morning of March 12, 1967. It was supposed to be a run-of-the-mill weather reconnaissance mission to see what the fighter jets would need to know for their missions later that day. Clark describes the scene in his book, The Eagle Hunts. He and the other pilot, Captain Ed Goodridge, fly in front seat. We're flying at just over 100 feet altitude and at 600 miles per hour, when orange balls of light suddenly started flashing all around. Anti-aircraft fire. There was a sudden thud in the plane's belly and the phantom began to roll, then tumble end over end. The plane, out of control, was hurling forward and falling back to Earth. There was a mountain ridge up ahead and Clark calculated at 600 miles per hour it was only four seconds away, about the same amount of time he needed to eject. With G-forces pinning his arms down, he was still able to pull the ejection handle between his knees. He was shot into the sky with a force of a 40 millimeter cannon, and when the main chute deployed, he saw a huge ball of fire on the ridge. A ball of fire that four seconds prior was his Phantom II. We knew it was 37 millimeter dead on target. Um, pulled up to get out of this dream of anti-aircraft fire from the ground. And, and as we pulled up, took a thump in the belly. It was just bump. And I thought, we're hit. But the airplane looks like it's still flying. So, hey, maybe we'll make it home. Uh, so about that time, everything just went crazy. I mean, uh, I, I have no idea what happened to that airplane. I didn't know it was upside down. I didn't know it was spinning around one way or the other way. I didn't know where the tail had come off. I, and, and I knew, hey, this airplane is not flying. This airplane is just hurling like a rock. Now, and it's going down. And there's that ridge over there. We're flying 600 miles an hour. We were about 100 feet over this ridge, and I'll bet we've gone down at least 100 or 200 since we took a hit, and it's doing this whatever the heck it was. So I decided, man, I'm out of here. Well, I tried uh, to lift my hands to get a hold of the ejection handles over my head. And I couldn't do it because I couldn't raise my hands. The G-forces were so heavy that I just couldn't lift my hands. So the, the stick is right here so I just dropped my hand and I said, I'll just slide it over there and see if I can get a hold of that handle that's been that's between my legs, which is the emergency ejection handle. So now that's what's going through my mind. I got to get a hold of that handle and I need to get out of this airplane. And about that time, I'm also thinking, you know, if this thing is flipping, then if it happens to be upside down, that seat is just going to shoot me right into the ground at, at 600 miles an hour. Uh, that's an immediate death option. Then I thought, but if it's maybe sideways up a little bit or up like that or maybe straight up, I'm going to have a chance to get out of this thing. And then I decided I don't have any time to try to decide whether it's up or down or where it is because I haven't a clue. So I just went for the handle. And I got a hold of the handle with my right hand and uh, try, I, I pulled it, it snapped. Well, the seat didn't fire. The seat didn't fire. I thought, oh, 
this is not a good thing. And, and uh, then I remembered about what the technician told me during my seat training. John, this seat, this handle will take a quarter of a second to fire the seat. So with your mind being all whipped up and, and uh, mental compression being what it is, um, it's going to seem like the feet, seat hasn't fired. So you just keep pulling and it'll fire. The next thing I knew, everything was gray. I mean, I was in the wind blast. And by that time, I couldn't care less whether I was going into the ground or not. I'd done it. I was committed. It was way beyond my control. And I was along for the ride. It was a hard landing with Clark still strapped into a survival pack and seat cushion. Vietnamese villagers and military personnel rushed toward him with shovels, hammers, as well as AK-47s and pistols. He was soon surrounded. The next morning, he was delivered to the old French prison, Wa Lo, known to American servicemen as the Hanoi Hilton. The other pilot, Ed Goodridge, had also successfully ejected, but once on the ground, decided to shoot it out with the enemy and was killed in the exchange of gunfire. Clark was imprisoned for five years and 11 months. Presumed dead, his family didn't know he was alive and a prisoner of war until they received Clark's first letter three years into his captivity. During those five years and 11 months, Clark was tortured or mistreated for propaganda or upon the slightest infraction of the camp regulations, as were the hundreds of other American prisoners. The torture devices included chains, whips, leg irons, solitary confinement, sleep deprivation, drugs, and threats of execution. And then there were the straps. Straps that bound arms behind the back in excruciatingly unnatural and painful positions. The prisoners survived by utilizing mental games, tap codes for communication and human connection, and prayer. He rose to the occasion during times when it was terrifying. He didn't know if he was alone. He could have been the only guy going through what he went through. He could die at any time. Uh, to me, that prospect was very, very uh, daunting. And uh, he, he shows me that I could probably deal with it if I'd had to. Yeah, when I think of John Clark and his military service, he and his fellow POWs are inspirations, certainly to this generation, my generation and those Americans today. But what I know is that his story will inspire generations in years to come. John Clark was released on February 18, 1973. He returned as an Air Force major and a hero to a very welcoming and grateful Columbia later that month. After some well-deserved rest, Clark obtained a master's degree in business administration. He resigned from his regular commission in 1977, but then served two years in the Air Force Reserves. And following that, he served in the Missouri Air National Guard as an emergency war plans officer. After several other assignments, Clark retired in 1992 as an Air Force Colonel. That was 10 years after he married his wife, Anne. She has been his partner and best friend ever since. This year, they are celebrating 41 years of marriage. Clark continued his life of service by becoming Columbia, Missouri's city water distribution engineer, where he was instrumental in preserving the city's McBain water treatment plant during the great flood of 1993. He retired from the city in 2000. He has used his retirement to travel the nation, making presentations on hope, faith, patriotism, and service. Colonel Clark's military decorations and awards include the Silver Star, two Legions of Merit, the Distinguished Flying Cross, two Purple Hearts, the Meritorious Service Medal, the Prisoner of War Medal, and two Republic of Vietnam Gallantry Crosses. Courage, faith, and patriotism. These words describe the very essence of this Boone County native and decorated hero. He served his country with distinction and like hundreds of other prisoners of war who were brought home, he returned with honor. Ladies, gentlemen, and esteemed friends, please welcome into the Boone County Hall of Fame, Colonel John W. Clark.
Good evening to all citizens and guests. Uh, Boone County. Can everyone hear? Uh, good. Welcome to all who are with us now and to those who may read this in the future. It is with great humility that I drop this cane <laughs> and, and, and approach this podium and accept this honor. It makes me appreciate our community's great regard for patriotism, grace in God, and good works. And so, I arrived in Columbia almost seven years after leaving for war as a 26-year-old first lieutenant, six months in combat, and six years as a prisoner of war in communist North Vietnam. No parade, no big greetings, just two of my very best high school buddies with big smiles and lots of pats. I wish I could name those names, but then where would I ever stop? Boone County in Columbia was giving me some space and so much appreciated it was. Well then in a couple of weeks there was a big reception in front of City Hall on Broadway where the mayor presented me a welcome home proclamation and then a pretty young lady with a handful of bracelets gave me a big hug and a kiss on the cheek. She and her friends had worn those bracelets during the many years I had been in that prison. There were lots of welcome home signs and wavings and smiles. And now, all these many years later, I get to say thank you, Columbia and Boone County, for your blessings and your love. Later, I was asked to be Grand Marshal of the Memorial Day Parade with Broadway just full of well-wishers, so many waving with American flags and shouting, all ages, from the little candy chasers to the old vets. I felt so honored, so proud. So these are the Americans. These are the Boone Countyans. I fought for and came home with honor to. As it was about the usual time for PTSD to evidence itself, so did mine. Not so disabling as that which haunted many of our veterans, but enough to rob my life of its vitality, thought processes, intellect, and injected a fear of people and crowds and public appearances. But it was God's work that my greatest blessing in ri arrived at almost the same time. 1980, 1982 it was. Well, I insulted her. She insulted me. I fell in love. She thought I could be a work in progress. <laughs> Our romance proceeded, and at one point she said to her best friend, yeah, you know, he is the marrying kind. And her best friend said, well, what if he doesn't like you? And she is reported to have said, oh, he will. I'll see to that. <laughs> and there you have it. We were married about six months later, and now 41 years of marriage, stress, anxiety, wonder, and bliss, and with our two sons, John and Thomas, are here with us tonight. We, Thank you. 
We were married about six months later after all that. Now after 41 years of marriage, oh, I said that I think already. Her commitment to our marriage was absolute. Eventually I was able to join the community, tell of my experiences, and write a book. A book growing up in Columbia, flying, war, captivity, and the discovery of faith in God. Entitled, The Eagle Hunts, it's a message. It's a message that could be applied to this confused nation. A message that says, reconnect with your God, learn to pray to him, and to hear his answers. They will be. Thank him for his moral guidance and his blessings, though you may be, cute, may be confused sometimes as to why we would call them blessings. And in that regard, I end by saying that I have inscribed in the front of the eagle hunts, it is not always for us to know God's reason why. I want to thank you all so much for being here this evening. I want to thank you for this award. And I want to say God bless to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would certainly appreciate it. Thank you and congratulations, Colonel Clark. Congratulations again, Food Bank and Morgan Thaler family. Um, you've made it quite a night. And um, I want you to know, all of you, volunteers, guests, everyone, that you've made this occasion special for everyone participating, thanks to your generosity of resources and spirit in honoring our new Hall of Famers. Please remember before you leave to check and see if you've got some silent auctions, so you may take them with you. The staff at Virtual Computers in Boone County History and Culture Center are in the back of the room and they will take care of you. The bar will stay open for another 15 minutes. Sarah, Mag, do you wanna meet me there? Um, on behalf of the Society and Endowment Boards and staff of the Boone County Historical Society, we bid you good night. Have a lovely rest of your year. Above all, drive carefully because we want to see you back here next year. Thank you all.